Recently, you may have seen my review of the Sigma 50mm f1.4 art lens. If you didn't see it, it's here. I wanted to do a follow-up video. For reviews, I try to focus on the equipment itself, what it does and doesn't do for me, and some advice or recommendations as to who it is right for and who it isn't. I put my opinions in my reviews, but I always try to maintain objectivity. For many of my reviews now, we're going to do it twice. First will be the official review, and then today for the Sigma is the more casual thoughts and a discussion of how it all worked behind the scenes. Oh, and stay tuned to the end of the video where I can show you exactly where you can download many of the photos that I took with this lens, both with me as the photographer and sometimes me as the model. And there's another video where I walk through the thought process and setup behind each shot as we worked with the lens, posed, and got the most out of it. For starters, let's talk about Sigma as the brand. With the art lenses, Sigma is trying to go after the big names, like Zeiss. They've used a designator, Art, to distinguish this lens from their other, much lower cost lenses. This presents a problem for Sigma. They've spent a long time developing their third-party, low-cost, value-oriented lenses. In layman's terms, this means, in my opinion, they've put out some crappy stuff. <laughs> when a variable aperture zoom is f6.3 at the long end and wiggles and wobbles in my hand, I don't have a lot of confidence in it at any price. Sigma plays on some buyer's drive to have a solid camera body and then worry about lenses later. They tempt you with big capabilities for half the price of manufacturer brand lenses. The problem I've had though is that many of the Sigma, Tamron, and other third-party lenses don't give me the confidence that they will work and function with repeated daily use. And frankly, when a zoom is f6.3 on the long end, that's limiting. While I do not think that many casual buyers realize quite how limiting this can be at a dance recital or a concert. What impresses me though is that with the art series, Sigma is breaking that reputation. The moment I mentioned the art lens on Facebook and on YouTube, comments immediately started praising what Sigma is doing with the art series, and that sort of positive perception doesn't happen on its own. It's the result of positioning and actual product quality, and there are many, many happy art lens users out there. In fact, these are good times for pixel peepers. With bodies like the D810 readily available, combined with lenses like this, you can shoot without hesitation, and you don't have to wonder from shot to shot if the color is right or if the image is truly in focus. Don't get me wrong, technique wins the day, but good tools, they're a key ingredient. It's heavy for a prime. I'm accustomed to these smaller primes or even a pancake. Half of the prime lens shooting experience for me is the small size and nimble handling. You lose that with the Sigma, though you do pick up sharpness and clarity. It's a tough call for me. I'm happy with the primes that I have, and I know how to get the results that I want from them. I know their limitations, and I know what to expect from any lens wide open. There is some debate about the Sigma's performance at f1.4, and it was even suggested that I may have had a bad copy. I'm not suggesting that Sigma is especially soft at f1.4, but every single prime that I've used, Sigma included, does not find its peak sharpness until you're getting upwards of f4. The fact that the Sigma shoots at f1.4 and is sharp among other lenses at f1.4 is strongly to its credit. Exposure went darker at f1.4, maybe half a stop. This required some adjustment when working at f1.4. It wasn't a problem to work with it, but it was something to keep in mind as I shot with it. Not a deal breaker by any means. And the cause? No idea. Perhaps it's not communicating with the body with exactly the same parameters that a Nikon lens would at f1.4. Okay, now let's talk about the photos. Raymond and I did a shoot in Flagstaff, Arizona with the lens. With Raymond confidently at the controls, we collaborated and positioned me in scenes that would play to the strengths of the lens, and then others that would really put it to the test. It did great across the board. Head over to snapcheck.com. For everyone, I've posted a full-size JPEG image from the shoot. For VIP members, pixel peepers, and other picture people, I've posted nine raw images and a huge gallery of JPEGs. This isn't something I do very often, but since this is a lens review and an expensive one, I did not want to hold back on the results that I published. There are a range of apertures selected so that you can see how the lens performs at your favorite settings. 
All of the EXIF data is intact, so you can see exactly how the camera was set. Normally I only publish edited images, but in the name of science and potentially spending $1,000 on a prime lens, I wanted you to see the absolute most detail available. Also, in a video, I take you through almost 50 shots taken with the Sigma lens, and some with the Nikon 50mm f1.8G. The what, how, and why. This is more in-depth than I've ever gone into before in a gear review. It's, it's one thing to review the lens itself, and that's what I did in the review video. In the in-depth VIP video, it's the convergence of the gear, scene, and poses, which all work together to deliver the goods. Not a VIP? You can learn more if you head over to snapchick.com. Scroll down to where you see this. From there, it takes you to a page with more information about the VIP plan and the membership options. When you're logged in, you can then see the complete post, and here are the links to all of the RAW and JPEG images. Keep in mind, these are large files, about 40 megabytes each. They're 14-bit, raw, lossless, compressed, 36 megapixel images from the D810. And if you just want to peek at the images without downloading, I put an entire gallery of screen-sized shots at the bottom of the VIP post.